Are there constructive things that you can do to help restore a culture of life? Find out next on this edition of Life Matters. Brian Johnston is the Western Director of the National Right to Life Committee. He has served in many capacities while advocating for innocent lives. As California Commissioner on Aging, as Chairman of the California Pro-Life Council, on the board of the National Legal Center for the Medically Dependent and Disabled. And now here's our host, Brian Johnston. Welcome back to Life Matters, your program on the right to life, on the culture that's impacted by it, and the battle of ideas. And we're in a very real battle of ideas. And the essential idea for our nation is that each of us, as human beings, our founder said, has been given the right to life. And it's the job of government to protect that right. All our other rights come from that. So this issue is very important, and if you've been a listener to Life Matters, you know we explore these things in depth. And today I'm in Washington, D.C. at a National Right to Life board meeting. I'm very privileged to be visiting with Carol Long Tobias, the president of National Right to Life. Hey, Brian, it's great to be on with you. It's good to be with you, too, Carol. You know, we just came out of a board meeting, and you were giving us a report. You've been traveling a lot. You've been dealing with this issue really around the world. You want to tell us a little bit about what's been happening with you? Well, I've been doing a lot of traveling recently. I got to go to Louisiana for the premiere of a great movie about adoption. I lived on Parker Avenue. I went to Reno, Nevada to speak at a Friends for Life dinner. I got to go to Missouri for a pro-life lobby day inside their state capitol. It's great. I love getting out, meeting all the wonderful pro-lifers who are just energetic and dedicated and giving of their time and talent to save those precious little babies. Yes, and that's really what our movement is, is individuals across this nation that care about protecting innocent human life. And we talk about babies, and most of the folks in our movement have been involved in crisis pregnancy centers, which is excellent. But ultimately, before 1973, it was the law that protected those lives. And one day, and that's what we're working for, is for the Roe versus Wade decision to be overturned, and citizens have to be involved in making sure that the law will again protect those lives. If we don't work for it, that won't happen. And so, Carol, you've been great, and you were talking, too, how there's challenges around the world. This right to life issue, I was inspired years ago by David Osteen. David Osteen is a mutual friend of ours and the longtime executive director of the National Right to Life Committee. And we get many reports at National Right to Life of what's happening around the world. And I remember David just saying in passing, you know, if we don't win the fight here, we can't win anywhere else. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. What I had started out saying that really the right to life is best expressed in the American founding documents that the American founders actually took that hope and aspiration of all mankind when our nation was founded and started a form of government that's built on the uniqueness of every human life. It's extraordinary. That's why people come to this nation. And that's why when we're talking about the challenge, it is a worldwide challenge. But we have to win here. We have to win the battle here. John Winthrop was the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, came across the ocean, and as he was coming to America, he wrote in his diary that this must be a city on a hill and everyone's eyes would be looking on them to see if they succeed. I think since that time, America has been a beacon of light for the world. I look around the world and I see a lot of problems when it comes to life. Mm -hmm. In the United Kingdom, you have hospitals and judges deciding which babies can get treatment and which Mm -hmm. ones can't, even if the parents of a baby might have another plan or have another hospital or somebody that will help take care of their child. The hospitals and the judges have decided that that child would be better off dead. Mm. Great examples are Charlie Gard, who was killed last year in a hospital by refusing all treatment. And there is a current battle going on over Alfie Evans. We see the Netherlands and Belgium and Switzerland pushing assisted suicide. Canada has gone downhill very quickly. It's very quick. Uh, Assisted suicide. Euthanasia. Open euthanasia stories or reports of maybe even medical teams that will be traveling around to help people kill themselves or to actually just kill the people. 
prisoners in the Canadian system mm -hmm. who have requested aid in dying, as they call it up there. And I just look at all of this and I think, you know, things have really changed quickly in a lot of places and we're starting to maybe hear more stories. But we have our own problems here in the country, in yeah. the United States. We have doctors denying medical treatment to babies with you know, maybe some genetic anomaly. We certainly have assisted suicide here. We have states trying to tell medical personnel that they have to participate in abortions if they want to keep their jobs. Yes. Um, so we have our own problems. And I know that there are pro-lifers all over the world working you know, to save life in their countries, and they are just as pro-life and just as dedicated as we are here in America. But I really think that America can and needs to be that beacon. We need to protect babies. We need to protect those with disabilities. We need yes. to protect our elderly and be that shining beacon, show the rest of the world that it can be done. That's right. That's right. And I think that is our hope because, again, the purpose of society, and it's been said many, many ways. In fact, I know in the Catholic Catechism, and actually, if you look up the right to life in the Catholic catechism, I forget the exact passage, I think it's 1173, and I'm not Catholic, but they've got great moral teachings. And it says that the right to life is actually not a religious premise, it's a premise for all societies, that it's a constituent element of a just society. In other words, to protect the innocent is what defines a culture. That's why a policeman has a badge and a gun, because the purpose of the law is to protect people from the harm of others that might do harm to them. And so if we lose that, if human life no longer has legal protection under the law, and it's merely those with the strength and ability or in the position of power, which a doctor is, we know that under the Hippocratic Oath, until the oath took place, doctors were free to kill. And they were known as witch doctors. They were the most feared member of society. You didn't know if that person was going to care for you or kill you. If it was up to them, they could do either one. That's actually the case now in the Netherlands. There's many people in the Netherlands that try to leave the country if they think they're going to get sick because they don't know ultimately how that medical system is going to treat them. And I hear reports here. I've seen it in nursing homes. But we want to make sure that our culture doesn't continue down this path because it's ominous. It really is, and we need to stop it. And I think protecting unborn babies and restoring the ideal that all human life, including for that unborn child, you know, life must be protected. Yes. And I think that at least maybe I'm imagining it, but I think if we start looking at those helpless little babies and say that life is precious and needs to be protected and we need to protect that baby as we would any other human being, I would certainly hope that that attitude would then carry on to all human beings. That's um, right. And, and I, I really try myself, and I can't say that I always succeed, but even those who would disagree with me, those who are on the other side, I always have to remind myself that their life, their lives, mm -hmm. are precious. Yes. And, you know, we see a lot of anger and bitterness and meanness and nastiness in our culture. Mm. But we have to remember that human beings are special. And even if they may not agree with us or be our, our friend or natural ally, every life is precious. And if we can restore that protection for unborn children... I really would hope that that would then carry on so that we would see every human life as precious. Yes, exactly right. We're talking with Carol Tobias. She's the president of the National Right to Life Committee. We're talking about the right to life itself, and we're going to be right back after this. You're listening to Life Matters. Well, hi. I just wanted to thank you for joining me. You know, I have good friends, children, young adults, and adults that have Down syndrome. And they are so loved. Their parents love them so much because they're the happiest people you'd ever want to know. I really love them. I'm going to tell you something, though, that's rather frightening. The government of France has now prohibited showing positive images of Down syndrome children and letting parents know how lovable they are. That's an actual law in France. Here in the U.S., 80-some-odd percent of Down syndrome kids are killed by abortion before they're born. In France, it's 96 percent. So we're not a whole lot better. 
If you'd like to help out, you can go to the National Down Syndrome Society, NDSS.org, to help out. That's NDSS.org. We really are in a battle of ideas, and lives really are at stake. And now back to more Life Matters with Brian Johnston. Welcome back to Life Matters. We're talking to Carol Tobias, the president of the National Right to Life Committee. We're talking about the right to life as a legal principle, as a statement of the law. It's the purpose of the law and of society to protect the lives of those that can't protect themselves. And if we lose that, then we're going to lose a whole lot more because that's the very basis of a just society. And Carol, we're in an election year. And National Right to Life is one of the few pro-life organizations that really understands the need in election years to make sure you've got good lawmakers, because ultimately we're talking about the law. What are some of the things that National is looking at this coming election year and why? Well, we certainly want to elect more pro-life senators. Currently, at least on the, the one vote that we had in the Senate, as to whether or not the Senate was even going to take up the pain-capable Unborn Child Protection Act to protect those babies from abortion who have developed to the point where they can feel pain. Mm -hmm. We had 49 senators Mm -hmm. out of 100. We need to increase the numbers of pro-life senators. We need to elect more members to the U.S. House of Representatives. But it goes much wider than that in all of our races, whether it be for governor, attorney general of any state, especially state legislators, we need to be working and doing everything we can to elect pro-life people so that they can pass the laws. I would love to see a time where every human life is precious and special and protected, and women are not seeking abortion even though it's legal. They just don't want it because abortion is, you know, a hideous procedure and we're not going to participate in it. But I don't know that that's going to happen. We're going to have to change the law to protect the babies. That's right. And today at our board meeting, we were talking and a lot of folks, if you follow National Right to Life, you know, the right to life is a self-evident truth, our founder said. And National takes that seriously. We want to show folks what's true. And that's why... Issues, you mentioned the pain-capable Unborn Child Protection Act. That's self-evident. You can see that's a baby that can't be gainsayed. Another issue that most people should be familiar with is the partial birth abortion ban, which was successfully debated and presented. And that was a huge victory on many levels because even the most radical pro-aborts couldn't defend that because this is self-evident. And a lot of times we have well-meaning friends and allies that say, well, we just need to protect a child from conception and that's it. Don't do anything else. And very often they don't understand that's not the best way to frame it if you're going to win people to your side, if you're going to win these votes, and votes matter. Right now we're looking at the Supreme Court, and it's a handful of votes. On the U.S. Senate, we just did the vote count. A single vote can make all the difference. Those folks who saw it was a great movie, Lincoln, about the passage of the 13th Amendment, I recommend you see that. Lincoln understood. It wasn't the Emancipation Proclamation, by the way, that ended slavery. In fact, that was about to be thrown out. That only applied to the war. Lincoln fought it very hard for the 13th Amendment, and it barely passed. The way to present the issue is a way that others can see it. They can see the self-evident truths, and nationalists specialized in that and dealing with the facts and getting the message across in a way that people just can't gainsay it. We need to change hearts and minds in this country, and we can do that. I mean, we've seen it, as you mentioned, with the partial birth abortion ban. That was a debate or discussion in this country that went on for more than 12 years Mm. from the time it was first introduced as an idea that we need to stop this particularly heinous type of abortion procedure to the point where it was actually finally upheld by the United States Supreme Court Mm -hmm. after the case had actually gone before them for the second time. But it was during that period that a lot of people in this country found out unborn babies have heads Unborn babies have brains, and they were being killed in this horrible manner. And I think that had a lot to do with some of our younger generations 
realizing, you know, when they grew up, that was the abortion debate. Yes. And we're talking about the unborn baby. We're giving that baby humanity, arms, legs, hearts, brains. They really do see that picture of that baby. So when we talk about pain-capable unborn children or abortions where the unborn child is killed by the dismemberment procedure where the arms and legs are torn off during the abortion process and the baby bleeds to death... Uh, We do that. I mean, certainly we want to protect all children, but we use those kinds of legislation, those topics, because we want people to stop and think about what's really happening in this country. Because even the most hardened pro-abortion person can sometimes stop and say, wait a minute, that's going a little too far. Mm -hmm. I don't quite agree with that. And we can start to work on those then when they start to look at something in a way that they maybe hadn't before. That's right. In fact, that's actually the story he's passed now, but of Dr. Bernard Nathanson. Dr. Bernard Nathanson was a founder of National Abortion Rights Action League. And yet as a physician, then he studied fetology. And the more he looked into what he was doing in abortion... And he gradually, he himself said, it wasn't just overnight. It dawned on him, this is clearly a unique human being, as unique as you or I. So we want to help others view it that way, as Dr. Nathanson had. Dr. Nathanson was immersed in abortion, and yet he was able to finally see these self-evident truths. And that's our job, is to make the facts known, and to do it in a way that's creative, in a way, though, that is very palpable to others. It's an unpalpable issue, but to make it very tangible so that folks can understand why our hearts are breaking over this and why the laws must be changed. Our movement is growing because people are changing their minds. We have a lot of women who have had an abortion at some point in their life. They Mm -hmm. either, you know, they might have just thought that's the only option. There was nothing else they could do. Others who have thought very boldly, well, that's my right, and that's what I want to do, and they didn't think any, you know, they were killing a baby or another human being. It was just, you know, something that they were going to do. Um, And they are now vocal and very effective spokespersons for the pro-life movement, saying, you know, please don't kill your baby. Don't make the same mistake that I did. Mm -hmm. We have legislators and elected officials who at one point in their life thought that it was a woman's right to choose and they weren't going to get involved. And then something hit them. They saw something, they heard something, someone said something to them that made sense, and they started looking at it, and now all of a sudden they're pro-life and they're voting pro-life. We need to be reaching out in, in a broad manner, educating people and just encouraging them to join with us. Now, the the great example is the Pain-Capable Unborn Child Protection Act. A poll that was done in January found that 56% of the people who identified themselves as Democrat and 56% of the people who identified themselves as pro-choice supported that legislation. Wow. Because to them, that made sense. So those are the kinds of things that we want to work on right now as certainly an effort to protect unborn children, but also as an educational tool. Yes, exactly. You know, and as we look at this, we were talking earlier to our good friend Jim Bopp, who is general counsel for the National Right to Life Committee. And some listeners are aware that there's a lot of talk about the Supreme Court. And Jim was talking about that. He's an excellent lawyer. He argues before the Supreme Court. But I think it's important while we we are counting noses, it's kind of self-evident there. But we're not on a death watch regarding the high court. We've got plenty of work before these. We need at least a couple more judges, to be honest, to really get where we're going. So don't just wait for a a judge to die and think that's going to solve everything. In fact, we can make the mistake that our opponents make. Our opponents view government as the end all. And they want massive government. That was not what our founders wanted. And they got what they wanted through the high court. We must not think that somehow the high court's going to bing, bang, boom, solve this. You're going to solve it as a pro-life citizen involved in your local chapter of Right to Life with your local state affiliate, supporting national right to life and getting informed and informing your community because that's how we change the culture. And then the laws will change. But we need to be ready. There are a lot of different things we can do. And I know I've heard this for so many years that it would be great to just raise a lot of money and do a great TV ad campaign. Mm. But once the campaign is over, 
you know, so is the commercial and the people haven't really mm-hmm. been impacted by it. Right. What is the most effective way of reaching into our communities is just talking to people. It might be talking to them at work, at church, over the you know neighborhood fence, handing out literature at a county booth or yeah. a local expo, you know, some kind of fair that you can set up information and hand out materials or have the fetal model set up so people can see what the unborn child really you know looks like. But we are reaching people one on one. If they know you, if they see you in a, in, you know that you are someone in the community that's going to be there to answer questions. That really is still in this day of technology and social media and all the different ways that there are to communicate. We certainly need to use all those methods. But quite frankly, one on one talking to people that you know and encouraging them to be pro-life or to look at the issue if they aren't really interested at this time, Mm -hmm. that I think is still the most effective way that we can bring people into the fold. We're talking to Carol Tobias, the president of the National Right to Life Committee. We'll be right back right after this. You're listening to Life Matters. This is an important update on Senate Bill 320. Senate Bill 320 would mandate that in California state colleges and universities, young women be given RU486, the abortifacient drug. This is not a morning after pill. This drug is only taken when the woman knows that she's pregnant and the child is well along. It attacks the woman's body first by preventing it from giving any more nutrition to that child. Only then does the child die and it results in a spontaneous miscarriage when that young woman can least control the situation. She sees the baby. She sees the clots of blood that come. It's extremely unpleasant. Once a woman has had this, she does not want another one. But your tax money would pay for it. Ask your state senators to vote no on Senate Bill 320. And now back to more Life Matters with Brian Johnston. Well, welcome back. We're talking to Carol Long Tobias, the president of the National Right to Life Committee. And Carol, we were just talking how folks need to understand that the pro-choice mentality is something that is much more sweeping than they imply. For example, in Roe v. Wade, the Roe v. Wade decision gives no consideration to the child. Basically, and he had to lie, it's untrue, but Justice Blackman said, we don't know when life begins. And after asserting that, decided that there would be no consideration throughout pregnancy. The child is not to be considered at all. That still is the standard in the pro-choice movement. It really is. They would not allow, if they have their way, any restrictions on abortion whatsoever during all nine months of pregnancy. That's why when you're even trying to do something reasonable, like say a woman who is seeking an abortion should be given information about alternatives to abortion, possible complications of abortion, they will fight that. They don't think that parents should be notified if their minor daughter is pregnant and considering an abortion. They don't want a limit on abortions once the child has reached the age where he or she can can feel pain. They just they want no limits on abortion whatsoever. So if you're going to call yourself pro-choice, then in their language, you would say that abortion should be legal for all nine months of pregnancy for any reason. That's right. Now or we, no reason at all. Or no reason at all. Now, that's probably 12 to 15 percent of the entire country. Yeah. But that is where the industry leaders are. That's right. Whether it's Planned Parenthood, the nation's largest abortion provider, NARAL, the National Abortion Rights Action League, the National Organization for Women, EMILY's List, which supports pro-abortion Democratic women candidates. Their position is no limit on abortion at any time during pregnancy. You know, I just... I know very few people who actually fit into that category, and yet those are the leaders, those are the speakers, the standard bearers for the abortion industry. That's what we're up against, and it's important that you remind your friends of that, because a lot of times they'll use the bumper sticker phrase, pro-life, pro-choice, and then they have some assumptions about what that means. You have to clarify. Remember, each one of these children is as unique as you are. You were that child at one time. You were that size. 
So this is, we're talking about human beings just like you. The only difference is their age at this moment. And before 1973, the law did protect those kids. And that was a benefit to our country. That was a huge benefit to our nation, that regard for for individual lives. So our our time is getting short, but Carol, what else can people do to really plug in with National Right to Life? Our website is nrlc.org. That's nrlc.org. They can go on and get all kinds of information, find out how their member, their representative in Congress, both in the U.S. House and their U.S. Senators, are voting on yes. pro-life issues. Yes. Some great information. The News Today is a yes. daily email that you can sign up for so you get information into your email inbox uh, on a daily basis, I think Monday through Saturday. There are just so many ways you can educate yourself, and then there are also you know, ways that you can help, ways to get involved. So I would encourage just people, go to the website, nrlc.org. That's right. And you can plug in with your state affiliate as well. Every state has an affiliate of National Right to Life. We're the participatory Right to Life organization that gives you a voice in Washington, D.C., which is where we are right now. We're just right across the river from the Capitol, and National has its headquarters right there, not too far from the FBI. And we want you to be involved in helping to restore the right to life. Carol, thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. I love meeting and working with pro-lifers all over the country, and I know that the listeners here are going to make a difference, not just this year, but this week. Amen. Great. Thanks, Carol. You're listening to Life Matters, your program on the right to life, on culture, and the battle of ideas. It's a real battle. It's not a metaphor. Because lives really are lost, are they saved, because of the efforts of you and others. And remember, if you're standing for the right to life, the facts are on your side. And facts are terrible things to waste. You know, if you're listening in, please remember that we're on the air because of your help. If you could, help us out. Tell us what station you're listening on, or if you're listening to podcast. We want to make sure we're meeting your needs. Let us know if you have any questions or comments. You can write to us at P.O. Box 935, Sacramento, California, 95812. That's P.O. Box 935, Sacramento, California, 95812. Or if you'd like to call the pledge, you could call our 800 number, 800-924-2490, 800-924-2490. Let them know that you want to pledge and a volunteer will get back to you. Please let us know where you listen to us, and if you have any questions, feel free to include those as well. Learn more about everything in today's show online at lifematters.life, where you'll find all the resources you need to protect life. Life Matters is a production of the California Pro-Life Council, the state affiliate of National Right to Life.